Wow, who could have guessed the trans woman was going to do a video on gender and religion? Ugh. I have noted your discontent, and you may place a comment card in the box labeled transgressions. You may be asking yourself at this very moment, what in the ever-living fuck does gender and religion have to do with each other? Gender is what's between your legs. <laughs> well, hello there, monotheists and or atheists and or focused and or woefully uninformed. Rather than argue against the figurative brick wall that is my computer screen, let's re-examine. How did you come to this stance? Was it through belief that God gave you the parts he did, or that your chromosomes dictated your sex and science says that must be biological law? Or, perhaps, you came to the correct, nuanced opinion that gender is unrelated to sex and is a characteristic of identity and not of physicality, from either a place of actually listening to science or by seeing the value of internal non-verifiable experiences through religion and have come to your conclusion that it is entirely possible to have that same experience with gender. If you said yes to any one of those questions, congratulations! Congratulations! Now you know how gender and religion are connected. Have a cookie. Throughout history, we can see a myriad of religious expressions spanning across all cultures. Likewise, we see a veritable cornucopia of avenues of gender expression, even in the modern West, a place viewed by many as the Christian patriarchal monolith of the world today. Third gender identities for much of history have been linked to a special connection to the spiritual and the divine. While this differs between traditions, we have seen, time and time again, third gender roles filling the place of religious celebrant in specific rites and being called upon for fulfilling duties not asked of folks within a more binary identity. However, this special connection is very often not enough to exempt them from the social stigma, isolation, and hate garnered by living as who they are. Many of the people in these third gender identities do not identify as transgender. If that confuses you, then this may help. These traditions hold that there are three or more genders, or no genders, or one gender, and that these individuals never transitioned from one gender or another, or that they are not some separate gender outside the norm, they are who they are. The Kinar are a third gender in the Indian subcontinent officially recognized by their governments, although by a name that they do not commonly self-identify with. Many Kinar practice rituals for both men and women. Within the Ramayana, there is a story of the god Rama bestowing to the Kanar the ability to grant blessings through special song and dance at occasions like childbirth and weddings as a reward for their devotion. In the Mahabharata, we see again the bestowing of blessings, this time as the hero Arjuna disguises himself as a Kinar and performs their rituals. Later in the text, we also see a wedding between two gods that ties the identity of the Kinar with a god Erevan, and every year in South India, a two-week festival is held in honor of Erevan by the Kinar, reenacting his sacrifice and performing rituals of their own. The connection between the Kinar and their faith is deep, and its roots trace back for the millennia. The Kinar also live in poverty cannot legally marry or vote, and very often have to resort to prostitution despite their own beliefs against it. Switching gears from the Indian subcontinent to the Italian peninsula, we now are looking at the Feminielli of southern Italy. Feminiello don't properly fit within the western conception of transgender. Eugenio Zito, a doctor of translational sciences at the University of Naples, states through his study that Feminielli seem to confirm, in the field of gender identity, the most modern idea of continuous modulation between the masculine and the feminine against their dichotomy. The roots of the Femenielli trace back to the Galli, a large group within the priesthood of Sibyl and Attis. This tradition dates back to 205 BCE, where it was spread by the Roman Empire. Some of these Galli dressed in feminine ritual garb, adopting feminine titles and mannerisms, and castrated themselves. Even then, the Romans had belief that the Galle had magical powers, ranging from blessing homes and bringing rains to banishing spirits and controlling animals and telling the future. In Rome, they were met with persecution by some and reverence by others. Feminelli today live a life mostly free from stigma and still play an important part in traditional festivals and dances. 
The Femenielli are considered to be good luck throughout Naples and Campania, and hold a distinguished position within their community for it. Those are just two examples out of countless numbers, but they help to establish that third genders have existed for thousands of years, and that they have existed across continents and cultures and have been tied with religion and spirituality deeply. Now, any discussion about gender and religion would not be complete without discussing identities that do exist within the modern Western binary. Many of us inside the US are familiar with the ways that gender impacts the various sects of Christianity that are prevalent here and your own role within those traditions. Within Catholicism, AMAB men are given the exclusive ability to become a priest and that, quoting from the Catholic Education Resource Center, there were other roles that Christ had in mind for women. Women were still able to participate in prayer or prophecy, but it was deemed by their creator that women were not to be active celebrants of the Mass. Note, I am partaking in mythic literalism here, but only because I am discussing Catholic theological positions, which are founded on that principle. The recent increase in women being ordained as Southern Baptist ministers is causing intense controversy within the Southern Baptist Church. Within Orthodox Judaism, there are rules for interactions between men and women. While like everything in Judaism, there is debate, a few of the rules follow as such. A prohibition of physical contact between unmarried individuals, a prohibition of isolation in a secluded or private space between men and women, conversation for pleasure, and a general warning that a man who speaks too much with his wife may be neglecting the Torah. Within Hasidic communities, it is not uncommon to find a woman working and being the household's main income in order to support her husband's religious study or their children's yeshiva education. Within neo-pagan traditions, we can first look at Wicca broadly and then into Dianic Wicca. Within Wicca, we see a binary of gender codified within the cosmos through deity, the horned god as the divine masculine and the mother goddess as the divine feminine. Yet. Even here we can find some fluidity through the realm of ritual. Wiccan rituals have been described as a liminal space, where the practitioners seek to achieve a balance of the masculine and feminine energy within themselves, and their own gender identity is put aside under the authority of the High Priestess and High Priest. This all changes when we look at Dianic Wicca. Originating in the 70s, Dianic Wicca is an AFAB woman exclusive sect of Wicca that worships exclusively the goddess. Within Dianic Wiccan theology, all of creation is just a variation of the goddess, including the god and all men, by virtue of conception, gestation, and birth occurring from a female body. Uh, Dianic Wiccans have a phrase that there are two kinds of people in the world, mothers and children. Dianic Wiccans emphasize the importance of the womb within their tradition. The womb is the source of a witch's power, and all spell work is coming from within the womb and being given out. Dianic Wiccans do not teach magic or theology to men or transgender women, viewing themselves as the women's mystery cult. Teaching an AMAB person or a trans man of their magic or mysteries would be a breaking of their sacred trust with the goddess. I would talk more about Dianic Wicca and all of its problematic takes, but I cannot be trusted with the women's mysteries, so you know, I mean, what do I know? <laughs> okay, nuance time is done, it's time to talk about the heathen shit where the nuance is banned and all. Oh, fuck. Some nuance crept through the door. D damn it! Heathenry, gender, where do we begin? So the stereotypical presentation women staying at home, weaving the kids and raising the clothes, and men going a-viking and tending the farm. How true is that depiction? While this was certainly the norm, it doesn't really paint the whole picture. Within Norse society and culture, we see a larger array of expressions. We have accounts in the sagas, look at Brynhildr in the Volsunga saga and Hervor in the Hervarar saga. Historical accounts from the Byzantians, John Skylitz, and the Danes, Saxo Grammaticus, as well as from archaeological digs of burial sites that show women buried in full battle armor or with battle axes and a variety of weapons, that women fighting in raids and military conflicts, while uncommon, were not unheard of. We also see that women were able to hold high social status positions, particularly if they exhibited confident and ruthless behavior. For an example in the sagas, look no further than Queen Olaf in the saga of Hrolf Kraki. 
we see women participating in the legal system as both judges and witnesses, though only in specific circumstances. Also of note, that gendered articles were really only found in the graves of the wealthiest of society, and that in the majority of graves, what a person was given was roughly the same regardless of sex. For these reasons and more, it has been proposed by some scholars within the field that the appropriate analysis of the North Society's view on gender is that of a one-sex system, wherein rather than man and woman, we see man and unmanly. The sex you were born with still carried weight to the role you were given in society, but by exhibiting the traits that were seen as societally beneficial, and in the case of the Norse, manlike, then you could alter to some degree the lot you were given. This paints a picture where there were roles associated with men and women, but that the inherent qualities of man and woman were not fundamentally different. Unmanly behavior, while often called womanish, was not automatically embodied by women. Here is where we will look at the concept of ergi, briefly. Ergi as the noun, arger as the adjective, was the Norse term for unmanliness, with translations ranging from cowardice to effeminacy to being a literal bitch. We have quite a bit of info about ergi preserved in the sagas and in Iceland's Grey Goose Laws. If you were to be accused of arger, you were given the expectation and permission under law to kill the person who had claimed that of you. To not do so would to prove the accusations true and confirm your status as a nithing. What were things that you could do to earn the title of Ergi? Well, you could be a male and be on the receiving end of a sexual action. You could be a sorcerer or performer of Sather, although not all kinds of magic drew the same fervent stigma. Galder and rude magic was more socially acceptable to perform as a man, while Sather and Spey were more firmly a woman's domain. It's worth noting that some sources argue the acts of theft or murder necessitate the use of Sather and thus added the knife of Arger, that whomever was capable of shattering a heavy lock silently in the dead of night had to have been assisted by these magics. I don't want to go too far into this because, in all truth, it is one of the least interesting topics of gender in Norse society for me. Being confirmed Ergi was punishable by death or exilement for the rest of the person's life. This didn't happen in all cases, but it was certainly common. This is usually the point where people often bring up Odin, a masculine deity, learning Sather from Freya, as evidence that he was Ergi, the stigma being pointed out in the Locusena. But the worship of Odin did not suffer because of this. Worth noting that Saith women, who had sons, on occasion would teach their sons Sather. So while it is not the appropriate or honorable thing to do, there was on odd occasion male Saith workers in history. Looking deeper into the theological part of things, we can see that the Norse pantheon is host to a litany of gods and goddesses that hold peculiar expressions of gender within the myth. Chief among them, Loki who on many occasions was known to shift their gender and appearance at whim. Loki is a deity who is reasonably taken to be gender fluid. Loki has birth to children, and as a shapeshifter was not shy from taking on the appearance of a woman. Notably, when doing so in the Thimskvitha, the pronouns used for Loki in this form are feminine, in contrast with that of Thor, disguised as Freya, maintaining his masculine pronouns. This is in contrast to the large amount of myths wherein Loki is depicted as a masculine deity. Next, we would have Odin with his connections to Sather, which we have already summarized, and then Skathi and Njorthur. We see evidence to suggest that Njorthur may have been the same deity as Nerthus, a feminine deity filling similar roles to Njorthur, her name being a feminization of the name Njorthur. Although it is also very possible that Nerthus is the sister god that is referenced in the Locusena having been married to Njorthur for a time, and Skathi, who has a masculine name, assumes traditionally male roles within myth and whose anger and vengeful spirit is calmed in return for a spouse. However, this is all a bit less impactful if we examine the culture through the previously discussed lens of a single-sex society. Now, there is also a myth wherein Skathi is depicted as a man in the Volsunga saga, where in Skathi's thrall is murdered by a son of Odin, and he is led out of the town as an outlaw. All of this together, it paints a pretty clear picture that within the Norse world, there is certainly no shortage of gender expressions and identities outside of the modern western model of the binary.
Now, there is so, so much more that I could talk about here. I haven't even begun to mention the Deesir, or the Philia, or Modronect, or the Priests of Freyr, or the role of the Volva. There's a ton to dive into, and in all likelihood, there will be a second video down the line as an extension to this one, diving deeper into the subject as it relates to heathenry. That being said, I'm going to say my piece now and get on with it. So, this is the opinion portion of the video. That's my opinion! When I first started writing this video, it was about a group of Wiccans that exist online that had claims of queer supremacy spiritually. I know, just... Wow. This video was going to be me tearing it apart and saying why, from a social and political standpoint, that this was a horrible idea and damaging to queer people everywhere. And I still hold that position. But I found, the more I thought about it, and the more I spoke with folks about their own views about how their gender and religion commingled, I realized that it was a pretty poor a take to try and examine a theological claim without regard to existing theology. And the more you look around the world, the more you see gender represented in our religions. My own personal thoughts on that, my hot take, is that it's just humans being humans. We live within our cultures and our societies, and we have created concepts of gender. I don't hold any Gnosticism on the issue of if gender is baked into the fabric of the universe and of the gods and spirits, but I don't believe that it is. I see that as us projecting onto deity and spirits our own identities, or that because we live in the world which we do, with gender, deities come to us in forms familiar to us, and that they choose a form in which to comfort us and a form a more human connection with us. At the end of the day, what is gender to a god? Now, I don't know. It could very well be that I am wrong, and that the gods and goddesses really do have gender, and that it is baked into the world around us. That would certainly be the consensus if you were to look around the majority of religions that exist or have existed. So while I may not believe in it, if you do, that's fine. If your gender is important to your religion, and the way that you see yourself fitting into the cosmos, that's great. But if it isn't, that's okay too. We are in a simultaneously unique, yet common position, in that as neo-pagans, we have the opportunity to shape our faith and our practice however we believe right, with the past to look back at, but not necessarily dictating every position. Gender is so inherently tied to culture and society that, in trying to pull away the religion we are reconstructing and make it fit within our culture and society, we're going to run into some questions without clear answers. So we have to make choices, and justify them theologically. It's a weird, nebulous vibe to stop on, but in a way, it's quite fitting for gender. So that's where we will stop. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, leave a like, and if you want to see more, consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell so that you will know whenever I post more thought-provoking content. Oh, I have to burp. Ugh. Oh, excuse me. Am I gonna cut this? No. No, I'm not gonna cut this. Fuck that. This is staying in. <sighs> take care. And take it easy. Ha, 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 ha.